All right, hello everybody. I'm Martha Minow, the Dean at Harvard Law School, and it is my tremendous honor and delight to welcome back to this campus Benjamin Ferenz, Harvard Law School class of 1943, Chief Prosecutor in the Eisengruppen case at the Nuremberg trial. Advocate throughout his professional career for accountability and justice and the creation of a permanent international criminal court, which now exists and which appropriately invited Ben Ferenz to give closing argument at landmark case at the International Criminal Court. The Harvard Law School has a Medal of Freedom that was established to honor the achievement of individuals who've worked to uphold law's fundamental commitment to freedom, justice, and equality. And to symbolize that commitment, the award bears the image of Charles Hamilton Houston, whose leadership of the struggle led to the landmark Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education and exemplify the highest ideals of our democracy. Those who have received the award in the past include members of the Brown versus Board of Education litigation team, former South African President Nelson Mandela, Chief Justice of Pakistan, Infiktar Chowdhury, and Brigadier General Mark Martins, both of whom stood up for the rule of law under very difficult circumstances. And it brings me tremendous honor and pleasure and delight to award the Harvard Law School Medal of Freedom to Benjamin Ferenz. Friends has agreed to talk with us. I'm going to just ask, uh, who's here? How many of you are law students? Woo! Okay, that tells you who's here. There's some other people here as well. Um, all of us are eager to hear from you. So, Ben, if you would, just say some opening comments about why you chose to do what you have done so passionately and vigorously for so many years. Um, I do hope that we will have time for some questions and discussion. But please, Ben, thank you for being here, and thank you for your lifetime work. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how much I could get on, on the eBay for this. <laughs> well, I am honored, really, to put in the same shoes as Nelson Mandela. Um, However, I have no idea what I'm supposed to talk about, but she said, tell him everything about your life in the last 95 years, anything you want, about five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll try to do that as best I can. Uh, and uh, I'm supposed to encourage you, inspire you, or inform you, or amuse you, I don't know what, but I have been brought here under false pretenses. This morning I was promised breakfast at another <laughs> meeting. <laughs> And what do they have? I'm looking forward to bagels and cream cheese, and they're giving me donuts and coffee, and I only drink tea. <laughs> <laughs> so then they promised me lunch. You'll see me see it here, that's the rest of it. <laughs> half, half a cookie and a quarter of a sandwich. <laughs> now, somebody looking for a case, a claim against the Harvard Law School? <laughs> well. <laughs> she has mentioned to you, it probably passed over your heads, it went so fast. My first case uh, turned out to be, she can't pronounce it, nobody can pronounce it, the Einsatzgruppen trial, it's ridiculous. Uh, my first case was when I was 27 years old. Uh, I had just graduated from the Harvard Law School. Uh, I was an expert on war crimes because in order to keep from starving, I had to work from various jobs, one of which was to do the research for a professor, Sheldon Gluck, uh, who was doing a book on war crimes. And so I did all the research, 
and uh, I remember getting paid very magnanimously for that. If you're any fellows here, I got $30 for a month's work. <laughs> My rent was $28, so I, had to, I was ahead by two bucks <laughs> because I couldn't live very well on two bucks a month. I went to the Divinity School, which was across the street. At that time, they had a cafeteria. And uh, I went to the cafeteria and I explained to them I was a student at law school and I had no money, I was hungry, I'm ready to work for my food, can I do something for you? And they said, fine, come right in. You come in at two o'clock, you'll clean up the dishes to clear the tables, and whatever food is left, you eat. <laughs> I said, fine, it was a good deal. So Harvard Divinity School saved me from starvation. Uh, the law school the wages there were starvation wages. <laughs> I wrote a book called Less Than Slaves, which was published by the Harvard Law School. You can read it sometimes. Um, and this morning, I was meeting the dean of the Divinity School to thank him for all those lunches. <laughs> In the meanwhile, of course, I think I paid for the lunches as well. And certainly, uh, the result of all this morning, morning's meeting also, I paid for the lunches again, <laughs> and then some. But I got an exchange for the broken cookie here, so I really can't complain. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you're looking forward to a very active career in the law, I can tell you, having been the chief prosecutor for the United States in what was the biggest murder trial in human history, 22 defendants accused and convicted of murdering in cold blood over a million people. I rested my case in two days. Reno Campo, eat your heart out. <laughs> And uh, they were all convicted, 13 were sentenced to death. My second case, now I brought along some souvenirs. I wonder what, what's going on here. My second case was, the, well I spent the time in between trying to create an international criminal court. At Nuremberg we felt that uh, after the horrors of World War II, where I was a combat soldier, uh, I was honorably discharged as a sergeant of infantry after three years of military service from the beaches of Normandy to the final Battle of the Bulge, for which I was awarded five battle stars. And I said, what was that? I was no hero. They said, well, you survived the five major battles of the war without being killed or wounded. And I said, well, that's a very good idea. <laughs> <laughs> There was no gold medal, of course, but <laughs> anyway, um, so I had my ex all of that experience of having been a learned scholar at the Harvard Law School, and uh, so I did pretty well as a private in the artillery during all of those battles, and through military fashion, they recognized my real talent. They made me a typist. I couldn't type. I still can't type. <laughs> all right, my second case, my second case. This was when I was 27. My second case, the first trial of the International Criminal Court in The Hague against Obanga. Uh, I was 92. <laughs> so if you're looking forward to a very active career in the criminal law, <laughs> you can look forward to uh, 90 years of thinking <laughs> before you're asked to put it into practice. It'll be a great career. <laughs> However, however, what brings me here? Uh, what brings me here, not merely to entertain you, but to warn you, it's a dangerous world in which you live. Much more dangerous than the world in which I lived. And I can assure you also, I'm very lucky to be alive, and I'm aware of it. Um, and uh, what makes it more dangerous is our high technology today. Today we have the capacity of eliminating all life on planet Earth from cyberspace. I don't even know what cyberspace is, or where it is, and all the equipment and so on. So it's a very dangerous world. And uh, I had witnessed all the horrors of World War II, a liberator of concentration camps. That was my function in General Patton's headquarters as a sergeant of infantry to get into the camps while they were SS running out, the inmates grabbing some of the guards, beating them to death, burning them alive, uh, dead people lying all over, 
they couldn't tell who was dead, who was alive. Um, and I had to collect the evidence of the crimes. It was not something I learned at Harvard. I had to dig up bodies of American soldiers who had been shot down and beaten to death by German mobs on the ground. And uh, I didn't learn that at Harvard either. But I learned a lot of things at Harvard which have stayed with me. And since the dean is here, I don't know about the statute of limitations. I've, uh, I confessed to her at one point that the last two years at the Harvard Law School, I was busy trying to get into military service without much success, initially anyway. I was turned down by this intelligence services because I hadn't been a citizen long enough. My parents had come to America Two people in their early 20s, no money, no skills, no language, no job, were lucky to be accepted as a janitor in a house and um, in Hell's Kitchen, which was a high dense crime area. Uh, so uh, I had lived most of my life in conditions which we didn't call them poverty in those days. We never heard of welfare, things of like that kind. But it was a different world. And uh, I look around today and I say, what can I do to prevent the recurrence? Now there's a representative here facing history in ourselves, Margot Strom, who many years ago set up the organization called Facing History in Ourselves. The object of that was to uh, face history by looking at the facts of the Holocaust and asking what can we do? We face ourselves, how did we let it happen? And what can we do to prevent it from happening? And uh, she's continuing on in that. Unfortunately, uh, she has a notion of retiring. I don't know what that word means. I'm in the prime of my youth. I'll be 96 pretty soon. <laughs> okay, cut out the commercial. Okay. <laughs> How do we go about making it a more humane world? What is the role of lawyers? in this thing. Uh, my conclusion is, after many, many years of working at this, that law is better than war, no matter what. Uh, law can make mistakes, there'll be miscarriages of justice, but it's certainly better than going to war. Because the current system is very simple. If the heads of state are unable to agree, what do they do? They take young people like you, now they take girls too, and young men like you, and they send you off to a distant land you may never have heard of, to kill people who never did you any harm, may never have done any harm to anyone. And you're instructed to kill each other as much as you can. And when you get through killing each other as much as you can, one of them says, we won. Or they start all over again a few years later. That's the world in which you live. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. It's homicidal, it's genocidal, it's suicidal. And what do you do about it? You're up against a tradition of thousands of years glorifying war making. Every classroom has a flag. You pledge allegiance to God bless America. Never mind the rest of the world, we forget about that. And it's the same in other countries. Uh, martial music. Everybody's heart stirs, you know, to the music, the marching, the bands, and we love our military. Sure, I love our military too. I love them so much, I don't want to have them killed. And when I lecture at military academies, and I try to, and I do often, I tell them truthfully, I'm here because I don't like you coming home in a body bag, and I don't like you coming home in parts, and I've thought and worked on this problem for a long time, and, uh, I, I've come up with, hopefully, some answers to move to a more rational world order, and I need your help. And that's why I'm here, I need your help. Now, I need your help specifically. We are now hamstrung at the moment with punishing the crime of aggression. I would say in the effort to create a more humane world, a field which has been seriously neglected is the legal field. We all know that the existence of the criminal law deters some crime. 
It doesn't eliminate all crime, but it certainly has a deterrent effect. And if you want to stop illegal war making, you've got to bring the criminal call law into play. The perpetrators who are responsible for using armed force in violation of the United Nations Charter, which means it's not in self-defense and it has not been approved by the Security Council, these perpetrators have got to know that they will be held to account. Crimes are committed by individuals. It's not committed by abstract entities. And we have to learn, although we seem to ignore it, that you cannot kill an ideology with a gun. People who are ready to die for their cause, whether it be religion or nationalism or economics, and ready to kill for their cause, you don't intimidate them. You have to come up with a better idea. And there are better ideas, but you have to give them a chance to state their case. Let them state their case. That's what law is all about. You don't shoot them once in the back and then once in the head and then three or four times more, as been the, on the radio this morning on the television, uh, new disclosures about bin Laden and plenty of You let him state his case. We put Herman Goering on trial. He stated his case as much as he wanted, and then he was sentenced to death. In my trial, Einsatzgruppen case, nobody can pronounce it. Einsatz means action group and its groups. Uh, the lead defendant, and I come back to un you, un giving you understand the mentality of a mass murderer, was Dr. Otto Ohlendorf. Dr. Otto Ohlendorf. Most of my defendants held doctorate degrees. All of them were high ranking only, I had I think six SS generals. What kind of people were they? Were they beasts? Some of them, some of the commanders boasted that they took the infants in order to save ammunition, smashed their head against the tree so they didn't have to shoot them. Others said, well, the we, mother was having the infant to her breast, aim for the infant, you kill both of them with one shot, you save ammunition. See, what kind of human beings are these? So you may be shocked and surprised to know that human beings just like people sitting in this room. Uh, intelligent, dedicated to the welfare of their country, their rights as they see it. Uh, very dangerous, of course. To whom? To others with another point of view. So we were trying to apply the rule of law to a sampling, a small sampling, of the 3,000 members of these Einsatzgruppen who every day went out and murdered thousands of people and reported on it in top secret reports which we captured, uh, describing the scene, who, who was in charge, how many people they killed, where they were, et cetera. So I was able to arrest my case in two days, relying only on the documentary evidence. I didn't call a single witness, because I knew from my studies at the law school that witness testimony is fallible, subject to cross-examination, contradictions, and so on, that these are the records, these are their records, contemporaneous documents, answer to the charges, and uh, they were all convicted, 100%. So this was unique experience, no doubt, but the basic principles of accountability, individual accountability, crime is committed by individuals, law must apply equally to everyone. Uh, crimes of this nature are in fact crimes against all of humanity as genocide has been recognized to be a crime against humanity. And I think I was the first one to use the term genocide, I've been told that, uh, in the opening of the Einsatzgruppen trial, where I noted that it was a plea of humanity to law. I was trying to substitute the rule of law for the mass killings. And uh, I've been trying to do it ever since. And there has been a tremendous growth uh, in recognition of that principle that all human beings are entitled to live in peace and dignity regardless of their race or creed or color. This has been my credo, and it is also the credo of all of the humanitarian uh, declarations coming out of the United Nations and of humanitarian organizations everywhere, but not put into practice. Um, 
But the progress is there. When I was at law school, there was no such thing as, of all things, a female in the class. You'd be expelled <laughs> if they caught you slipping a girl into the classroom <laughs> or into a dorm. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but look at it today. The dean of the Harvard Law School, female. The other dean, she's sitting down the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, Tremendous change that was unthinkable when I went to law school. And uh, so you see that awakening of the human conscience, recognition that we must have a more humanitarian universe, that the world is shrinking by virtue of our new communications technology. Uh, I could talk to my grandmother in China by taking out a little instrument, except I don't know how to work the instrument. And I don't have a grandma in China. <laughs> <laughs> but the potential is there. <laughs> Not for a grandma, but. <laughs> I, can I ask you then to sit down? Yes, I am I'm standing. They don't know if I'm sitting or standing. And would you be willing to answer some questions? Sure, I have no choice. Okay. I haven't finished my tea. <laughs> Moshe Gersel. Uh, my question is actually, I, your personality is so uh, uh, enamoring and so uh, positive. So, like, what attitude would you say has helped you most throughout your career to be productive and, uh, and successful and carry you through? Well, the attitude is a very simple one. If you're crying on the inside, you better be laughing on the outside, or you'll drown in tears. Other questions? Yes, and identify yourself. Hi, I'm Heidi Gardner. I'm a lecturer here at the law school. And first of all, thank you so much. It's a blessing for us to, to hear your story. You've talked a lot about the successes that you've had along the way and the fortune that you've had. But I imagine that there were some setbacks along the way as well. And I think we can all probably learn from somebody with that kind of experience what it takes to have resilience. How do you bounce back from a setback? I can give you also a very short answer. Never give up, never give up. There are three answers, never give up, never give up, never give up. Uh, of course, there'll be setbacks. Of course, there are ideas people will think you're crazy. But they can't think I'm crazy. I'm a graduate of Harvard Law School. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and say who you are. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Edward Pushenko. I'm an LLM, which is you know, Master of Laws. And I'm from Kiev, Ukraine. Uh -huh. We are facing a very difficult time right now. It's like you know David and Goliath in a way. Um, having the confrontation with Russian Federation, official and unofficial. But uh, at the moment, as of this morning, there's more and more troops, Russian troops are being poured into Ukraine to start probably moving towards Mariupol, which is the second biggest port in Ukraine, and then trying to build a land bridge to Crimea, because Crimea is destined to die without the supplies. They cannot supply it by sea, so they have to have a land corridor. Uh, we didn't start this war. There was no problem, you know, whatsoever with the Russian language. You know, we, we're a multinational country. Everybody speaks whatever language he wants, or she wants, or they can. And um, this was created artificially by our big brother, big neighbor. Do you see any potential if there will be an attack on Kiev? Because when they call my mom, you know, she's terrified, she's in Kiev. They're like waiting for the Russian bombers to start bombing Kiev. And it's 2014. It's a very different time. But are we staying, you know, where the Europe was in 1939? Are we, do you feel that we're at the same historical intersection when critical things will happen and the world is gonna look very different after this period? It's a very profound question. Uh, I'm personally particularly interested in Kiev because one of my Einsatzgruppen boys were in Kiev. They killed 33,771 Jews who were dumped into a ravine at Babiya on 29, 30 November 1941. Uh, and uh, that made it very real. I had the killers there. Um, they're, not, they're no longer living. 
But to answer your question, another thing comes to mind. My sister was born in the same house. I was born in the same bed. Not the same time. <laughs> I was born <laughs> about a year later. She was a Hungarian. I was a Romanian. The borders had changed. It didn't change our life. And my approach to problems of border change is that what's important is not what they call it, whether it be called the Bronx or Brooklyn or Hungary or Romania or Transylvania, which is what it was called, but how the people are treated there and what are their opportunities there. And if they are treated well and they are given normal rights to live in peace and dignity, what difference does it make? Whether they, if they want to wave the flag, fine. But when they kill somebody else because they wave a different flag, that's where the criminal law steps in. Now what will happen when a nation, for its own political reasons, I don't like to take specific cases because your prejudices show up then, but nation A, for its own political reasons, wants to annex part of nation B. That's a violation of principles of sovereignty, but the whole principle of sovereignty is itself under attack and should be because the world is now changed. Uh, the notion of absolute state sovereignty, any state can do what it wants, is absolutely obsolete. We are all one international community growing increasingly that way because of the communications revolution. Now what will happen if country A, I would say as long as they are not using armed force uh, and killing people, don't worry too much about it. Tell your mother not to worry <laughs> because there's no advantage and they're going in and killing a lot of people and starting again with World War II. I don't believe that Putin or anybody else in his right mind would let it come to that. Uh, they will settle it. They're arguing about borders as they are in many other countries and have been for many years. That's not the important thing. Don't spend all your money on armaments and certainly don't try using armaments. What can you do to enforce it? Nothing. Because, not because it's right, because we have not yet built the structures that we need for a lawful society, international society. We need laws which are binding on everyone equally. You need courts to enforce the laws, and you need enforcement. We don't have an enforcement system on an international basis yet. This is a job for you. Uh, I can't get to it. All of my books, incidentally, are free on my website, which is my name. And I have two volumes on enforcement, two volumes on defining aggression on international court. It's all there. And all kinds of articles. Read them. Use them. Plagiarize them. I don't care. There's no cost. <laughs> Just if you agree with it, spread the word. If you have a better idea, write up another book and say with a better idea. So it's one of the uncertainties of living in a turbulent world, which is not governed by reason and not governed by law. It's governed by tradition, by suspicion, by propaganda by politics, all of these factors, I've lived through them all. Uh, some people have not lived through them all. That's the price you pay. But until you realize that the law has a vital role to play in an orderly society and continue to build in that direction as we are already doing, so good luck. So I have a question. Uh, <laughs> Ben, you, you have fought very hard for recognition of the crime of aggression. And it's uh, sort of recognized and sort of not, but it's not been enforced. And you have developed actually an argument that crimes against humanity should be understood as big enough to include the crime of regression. That's a legal argument. Can you explain that legal argument and can you explain whether or not you think that argument is going to find purchase, are people going to agree with you? And how can people carry on the work that you have started? I thank you very much, Dean Minow, for asking me that question. I got so wrapped up here in telling jokes, I forgot the essence of what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> However, she has raised a very important question. In 1945, when the UN Charter was drawn up and accepted, the nations of the world had tired of war, and they felt that there should be an international criminal court to deal with the crimes of war, including aggression was the first crime, and uh, they should have a committee set up to draw up a draft code of crimes, including the crime of aggression, and eventually we would have the rule of law applying to the situations which gave rise 
to the World War II, which, in which over 100 million people were killed. I know some will contest the figure. Nobody knows how many people were killed, but I know what I've seen. I've seen people dumped with bulldozers into ditches. I've seen people die of a broken heart, of disease, and so on. So we were trying to change that. Then those who didn't want to come under the control said, ha ha, first we have to define aggression. Well, you'd say, what's so difficult about that? But lawyers, as you know, can quibble for years about the definition of a word or of a sentence, and they were demonstrating their skills. Why? Because they knew their clients didn't want to accept the terms. The big powers were not ready then and are not ready now to accept international controls over their decision when to use armed force to protect their national interests. What is the effect on you? You're in a very dangerous spot, kiddos. Very dangerous. There's a loophole in the law, a big gap in the law. And despite all of my efforts, and I don't want to go in detail, everything is on my web, you can read it. I said I'm going to try another road. Uh, if the courthouse door is locked, I'm going to go through the window. And if the window is locked, I'm going to go through the roof. And if the roof is blocked, I'm going to take another route. And I'll tell you all the routes because you're involved. First route, aggression, do what you like with it. You don't want to accept it? I can't change it? Good luck. Go then to the smaller nations who are more inclined. They are not going to commit aggression. They're not, and ask them to write it into their law that it's a crime punishable. We will have some measure of success there. But take a, another train, an express train, I call it, call it a crime against humanity, which was also condemned at Nuremberg as this, a, a supreme international crime. Aggression was a supreme international crime. But the other crimes against humanity included all the other offenses, rape, murder, pillage, etc. If you call it a crime against humanity, it is not subject to Security Council control. They could, of course, always intervene in any conflict and assert their power. But they don't have to, under the Charter, act as they do in connection with aggression. So you bypass the Security Council by giving it a new name. You also have with it the benefit of no statute of limitations to crimes against humanity. You have it the benefit of more comprehensible to a public because Nobody wants to say we're in favor of crimes against humanity. Uh, and hopefully, we can get it accepted in a simple way. The current statute of the International Criminal Court defines crimes against humanity. But quite normally, I mean, invasion and a, they list all kinds of crimes, murder and uh, all, all the spoliation, and devastation beyond military necessity. And, but there is always a catch clause at the end and other inhumane acts, such as, and they, which cause great human suffering. If we insert there other inhumane acts, such as the illegal use of armed force in violation of the UN Charter, we have opened up the door a bit for courts to charge in addition to aggression if they can, or without it if you can't, charge crimes against humanity. What do I mean by an other illegal act? It means a la an act, the persons who are responsible for planning and preparing and directing the action are the only ones to be held accountable. They are responsible for it. Illegal means it's not in accordance with the UN Charter. It's not in self-defense. Self-defense is permissible uh, under the Charter. and. Uh, it has not been approved by the Security Council, which everybody hates for good cause. So you can define it in another way and bring it within the jurisdiction of the court when so designated. Um, that's the second approach. That's the approach of going in through the window. Don't call the baby aggression. Call it a crime against humanity. Bypass the Security Council and proceed to punish crime against humanity as an other inhumane act uh, because it's where the perpetrator knows that it will inevitably kill large numbers of civilians. The third approach, which is going through the roof, is uh, 
to call it an en another appropriate name, a crime which is subject to universal jurisdiction. If you want to be impressive on your clients who don't speak Latin, you can call it Jus Corgans, Hostis Humani Generi. I don't speak Latin, as you can see. Uh, and uh, uh, that means these are crimes which are so despicable that they should be punished by any court, anywhere, which apprehends the perpetrator. Um, that began with piracy. And the argument can well be made that if the hijacking of a ship by pirates and the theft of property uh, is a crime, what about killing of thousands of innocent people? Is that not a crime? If a mur single murder would qualify as a crime against humanity, why not illegal use of armed force? I think that argument would prevail if given a public hearing on it. So uh, uh, that's the second string. There's a third string of the bow is to give it universal jurisdiction recognition. That's where the, the lawyers come in. Write a law review article. What are the parameters of universal jurisdiction? What are the parameters of other inhumane acts? What are the pro pros and cons? Good law review student can contribute to the knowledge in that field by beginning to study it and seeing whether we can move forward on that. The fourth step, of course, is go to the street. I think that the public, particularly young people, will not tolerate a system, for long anyway, where there is no way of bringing to justice people who have illegally been responsible for using armed force, knowing that it will inevitably kill large numbers of civilians. If the legal institutions are not competent uh, and haven't been uh, built yet, the people who have to go out and die for that cause, I mean you, we're going to say, hell no, we won't go. I saw it in Vietnam, and we may yet see it again. But let us try the legal route and proceed, even if it be slowly, to build up our legal institutions so they are clear it is no longer the right of anybody, or any leader, to kill large numbers of people because they don't share their ideology or their religion or their race or their color, which is what drove me in when I was 27, a long time ago to work for, and I'm still working for it, and I appreciate your help. Thank you. Uh, who would like to ask a, another question? Yes. Um, and I'm say who you are. Greg Green, I'm a, actually an astronomer. <laughs> <laughs> um, isn't, when we were talking about uh, bringing countries to account through some sort of legal mechanism, um, it seems like that's possible with smaller countries, but with larger countries, you know, just to name a couple of examples, like the United States, yeah. Russia, any other country, that it really has, you know, it's a Security Council country or has, you know, significant power in the world. Um, isn't it really a political question of whether or not they're able to be brought to account? So, for example, if, if someone were to indict Bush for the Iraq war, for example, mm -hmm. it would be very, very basically impossible without political support in the United States to actually bring them to account. So, do you see any possibility um, in the future for there to be actually political support in the powerful nations actually to bring their own leaders to account? Uh, the answer to your question is yes, there's a possibility. But let me be more specific. We passed a bill uh, some years ago, Service Members Protection Act. Does that sound great? We want to protect service members. I want to protect service members. I was a service member. And what does it say? It said if anybody dares to send an American soldier or anybody from America to The Hague to be tried, the United States is authorized to use all necessary force to free him. That made the Dutch government quite annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> and a group of Dutchmen about your age called me up one day, and they said, Ben, we're going to protest that, and we're going to protest it by lining up the beach at Scheveningen, which is a beautiful beach, a beautiful hotel there. The court is right nearby. We're going to plant soldiers there from each of the 100 nations who have ratified the statute, equip them with bayonets, and tell the United States, come and charge. We're waiting for you. And they're going to protest. And would I join them in the protest? And I said, no. <laughs> I will only join you on one condition, that I haul up the American flag, and I'm the last speaker. He said, you got it. <laughs> 
So off we came on the day. It was March 11th. I was then only 83 years old. And <laughs> they drank a toast to me at a reception at the, at the Queen's Palace later. I go there on the day. Unfortunately, it was raining, snowing on the beach. They're all lined up, all these dummy soldiers. The sandbags were being filled all day long to get them. And they go through and they say, United States, fooey. <laughs> and they go down. And I come and I say, look here. I landed not far from here in Normandy, wearing the uniform of the United States. I have not come here to attack the United States. I have come here to defend the United States. The people who have put through this law don't speak for the people of the United States. It's a small conservative minority which is blocking justice. The American people believe in the rule of law. And the American vision is epitomized by this flag. I want you to join me in saluting the American flag, which ends with liberty and justice for all. That's what the United States stands for. Hooray for me on the beach. <laughs> then I had to run back to the reception. My shoes were full of sand. <laughs> but I had invited the American ambassador who was on the beach, a friend of mine, David Sheffer, the ambassador for war crime. I said, will you join me? He said, I'll think about it. I, before I made the speech, and I asked also the head of the Coalition for an International Criminal Court, who was also there, I said, will you join me in holding up the American flag? He said, no, I better not do that. So there are the political considerations still on the horizon. People are afraid to lose their job, they'll lose their position, but you've got to be bold. Think outside the box, be brave. If you know that what you're doing is right, go get it. <laughs> One more question? Yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, my name is uh, Rebecca Cohen. I'm a Danish LLM student. Can you hear it? Can you speak a little louder? Can you speak yeah. a little louder? Yeah. Uh, my name is Rebecca Cohen. I'm an LLM student from Denmark. From Denmark. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned Fabiana before, and I was just wondering, um, being the prosecutor, seeing what you saw, which is also that the Einsatzgruppen could not have succeeded as, as well as they did without help or at least not assistance from local population. How do you I don't know, how do you work with, with how do you deal with this afterwards? Like after going through these trials, if you go back to Germany, you go back to Eastern Europe, how do you deal with the fact that you know that these people did those things? If I understand the question you were asking me, knowing the horrors which were perpetrated by the Germans at Babiar and elsewhere how do I feel going back to Germany? Uh, I understand the question very well. And I faced that question when the West German government offered to give me their Medal of Honor, like the Medal of Freedom given me here, their highest civilian award for Dienstkreuz Erste Klasse, Order of Merit for his class. And I thought, how will some of the victims feel? And I was familiar with the fact that some of the victims said it would be a disgrace to sit down with the Germans and negotiate, as I did, a treaty to compensate the survivors. I said, how would they feel? Some of the survivors refused to accept any money. Others said it was a treasonable, despicable act to sit down with the leaders of the country who tried to exterminate them all and start talking about money payment, you know, he would dare to sit and ask for payment who, who killed my family and so on. So there were very strong feelings, the type implied by your question, did I have such feelings? Uh, I did not have those feelings at that time either. I didn't think there was any justice in allowing people to commit the crime then keep the spoils with somebody trying to get them back. Um, and I thought the needs of the victims had to overcome that. But in connection with my accepting the award, I decided that it would be wrong for me to say, no, I will not accept it. I would be putting the children responsible for the crimes of their parents. And I thought that was unfair. And uh, I was grateful for the fact that the new generation was thinking differently. So I accepted the award. Uh, I don't wear it except when I'm in Germany. <laughs> when I have another big thing like this, you know, I look like Rommel. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> 
So. <laughs> Silence is uh, no excuse. I, the Germans were bystanders, many of them, because they didn't dare do otherwise, many of them because that was the mood of the time, many of them because they were convinced that there was a new world order coming and it was Adolf Hitler who could deliver it. Uh, most people who supported him felt that way, there's no doubt. Um, but the ideals, it was Ollendorf, who, Dr. Ollendorf, who killed 90,000 Jews, who said, we have to do that. And he, uh, because we presumed that, uh, well, he didn't say presumed, we knew that the Russians were planning to attack us. Well, how did you know that? Well, Hitler had more information than I had, and that was the conclusion, that it was a uh, putative Notstand, as they call it in German, presumed self-defense. Therefore, we had to act in self-defense to strike first. And uh, I said, you attack Germany, attacks Poland, Holland, France, Norway, uh, all the countries. No one was attacking Germany. Yeah, but if we know they're going to attack, then we're entitled by law to go and proceed. Well, the judges, three judges, American judges in this case, led by Michael Musmano, Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, said, it's a terrible idea that if everybody thinks that he's going to be attacked by his neighbor, therefore he's entitled to go across and shoot him in anticipation in order to avoid the attack, what kind of a world would we have? And of course, those who made the argument were sentenced to death in a court, the United States versus, and Benjamin Forenz, chief prosecutor. And you know, when I read that the military manual, uh, the quadrennial defense review, does not prohibit anticipatory self-defense. It means that's still a reserved right, reserved by the United States Army today. And we hanged this guy by the neck until dead. It took eight minutes to him to die. Uh, Ben Ferenc, we could talk with you forever and ever. It is a time when people are going to start leaving for class, and I want to give everyone a chance to say thank you to Ben Ferenc.